Okay. All right. Um, let me go ahead and get started here. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is James Bartek, and I am the programs manager for the Kentucky Military History Museum at the Kentucky Historical Society. And I'd like to welcome you to the inaugural presentation of the Kentucky Military History Museum speaker series, uh, which will focus broadly on various aspects of military history, but with a particular emphasis on topics that relate to the Civil War, to Kentucky history, to Appalachian history, and to Southern history. Uh, many of the presentations uh, will be virtual and they will remain free to the public, while others will be in a hybrid format held in person at the History Center in Frankfurt, but also able to be viewed live via the uh, KHS Facebook or YouTube channel. Uh, our next presentation is going to be on April 25th at 6.30 uh, with Professor Jonathan Jones of VMI, who will present on Civil War Soldiers and Opioid Addiction. Uh, tonight's presenter is Dr. Dwight T. Pitkayley. Uh, Dr. Pitkayley, excuse me, uh, received his PhD in history from Texas Tech University and worked for the National Park Service for three decades, the final decade as its chief historian. Uh, following his retirement from the National Park Service in 2005, he was a professor of history at New Mexico State University. He has won numerous academic awards and honors over his career as well as authored dozens of articles. Uh, he is the author and editor of several published works, including The U.S. Constitution and Secession, a documentary anthology of slavery and white supremacy, and that was released by the University of Kansas Press in 2018, uh, as well as a trilogy of works on the secession crisis in the middle and, middle and border South, the most recent being Kentucky and the Secession Crisis, a documentary history, uh, which was released by the University of Tennessee Press just last year in 2022, uh, which deals with political events in Kentucky during the secession winter of 1860 to 1861 and the Commonwealth's attempt to navigate the crisis of civil war. A um, few notes, uh, this presentation will be recorded and at some point it will be available uh, to view on our YouTube channel. The Q&A function has been enabled, I think, let me double check that. Yes, it has. Um, so if you have any questions, I encourage you uh, to post them on that, uh, that chat box there, the Q&A box. If you have questions for Dr. Pitkathy, uh, just type them in there as we go, and we will try our best to address them uh, as we can after the pre uh, presentation. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Pitkathy. Oh, thank you, James. Um, it's good to be back in Kentucky, uh, at least virtually. Um, my interest in this subject began when I was chief historian of the National Park Service in 1998. In that year, a group of Civil War superintendents got together in Nashville to discuss common interests. And one of those was interpretation. It turns out that when the Civil War battlefields were transferred from the War Department to the Department of Interior to the National Park Service in 1932, the Park Service developed an unwritten policy that it didn't talk about causality and the Civil War. The belief then was that if we talked, if the Park Service talked about causality, it would end up talking about slavery, and it was assumed that many of the visitors to the parks would, would be made uncomfortable by that. That unwritten policy lasted from 1932 until 1998, when these superintendents gathered in Nashville and they decided with the centennial of the war approaching, it was time to talk about causality. The meeting was not private or secret in any way. A report was written uh, by the superintendents. And when word of that got out, there was a considerable pushback. I received uh, in Washington on my desk uh, about 2,100 cards and letters protesting this political correct decision by the National Park Service. The Park Service even received a heritage violation from the Sons of Confederate Veterans. I, we were prepared, I think, for, for some kind of pushback. I was a bit surprised by the extent of it and the ferocity, if that's the right word, of it, uh, 
And it made me realize there was a larger gap than I realized between what scholars believed secession was all about and what a considerable portion of the public thought secession was about. So I, I resolved then in, at, in my retirement, everybody needs a retirement project, that I would uh, delve into the primary sources of secession to satisfy myself about what it was about. I had read fairly widely in, um, in the secondary literature, both when I was in the regional office in Washington, which managed Antietam, Manassas, and Harper's Ferry, and then even more as chief historian when I was part of a, a group of historians designing the new visitor center at Gettysburg. In fact, if you, if you venture to Pennsylvania and go to Gettysburg, I would urge it. It is, uh, I think, the best Civil War museum in uh, the country, certainly the best in the National Park Service. So I, as I, I committed myself in 2005 to going through this material, I should say that I had absolutely no idea what I was getting into. I had no idea what sort of documents I was looking for, how, how voluminous they might be, where I might find them. But over the couple of years, I started working with these. I'll get into that in more detail in a minute. And Daryl, I think it was Daryl Meadows, who was then at the Kentucky Historical Society, learned of my work and invited me to come to Frankfurt and, and participate in a couple of teacher workshops. I think I did that twice, maybe, maybe three times known. One of those trips uh, as Daryl and Patrick Lewis, now with the Filson and Tony Curtis, were taking me back to the airport. We discussed the the amount of information that uh, that Kentucky produced over secession winter. And I, I think I, I suggested that that because of that, somebody ought to write a book about it. And it was either Daryl or Patrick said, that's a great idea, Dwight. Why don't you do that? At the time, I was working on the larger national piece that James mentioned, the US Constitution and Secession, a documentary anthology of slavery and white supremacy. Um, and then I turned to uh, the, I had all this information there about, uh, actually, I should have said earlier that, that I'm up to about, about 10,000 pages of published material that constitutes the primary source material of secession. Um, so I ended up after the, the Kansas book came out with a lot of material. And, and so right now I'm, I'm working with the University of Tennessee Press producing this uh, series of state-based document books uh, dealing with secession. Tennessee came out in 2021. Kansas came out last year. I'm sorry, Kentucky came out last year. Virginia should come out later this year in the fall. I'm working on Missouri and, and Texas uh, should be the next in, in the series. So that's sort of the broad sense of, of what I've been doing um, in, in retirement for the past 18 years. I want to talk specifically about Kentucky and, and talk about two arcs, if you will, <clears throat> a chronological arc that is basically the, the track of, of Kentucky from Lincoln's election to, to um, essentially the attack on Fort Sumter. And then within Kentucky, the second piece of this will be Kentucky's efforts to form a solution, to come up with a compromise to to secession. So let's talk about the arc first. It begins natural, could be again in a number of places. I'll begin with the 1860 election when uh, there were four candidates, as you, as you well know, and Lincoln won as a distinctly minority president with 39% of the popular vote, but with four people in the race, it was enough to garner a victory in the Electoral College. A second piece of that election is not well known and not much talked about, but it deals with the congressional election. In 1860, the Democratic Party won both houses of Congress. So the setup nationally was Lincoln won the executive branch, the Democrats won the both houses of Congress, and of course, Roger B. Taney, pro-slavery chief justice, was still ruling over the Supreme Court. Democrats had controlled Congress both houses uh, for the decade of the 1850s, with two exceptions. 
It controlled the Senate throughout the decade. It lost the House twice to Republicans, once after the, in a pushback from the Lincoln, I'm, I'm sorry, from the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854, and the second in 1857 in the in the backlash of the Dred Scott decision. But in 1860, Democrats would have controlled both houses of Congress, which would mean that, or which would have meant that, Democrats would have controlled Congress for the first two years of the Lincoln administration. I've come to realize that's a very important piece to understand as we talk about um, secession and arguments in favor of and against secession. Locally in Kentucky, of course, the governor was Beriah McGoffin, who leaned towards secession, but wasn't an, an avid secession as, as governors from the secessionists, as governors from the Deep South were. He agreed that Republicans were a threat to slavery, and I'll talk a little more about that threat later. But he realized and and wrote in an op-ed piece that was published in a local newspaper that secession was not the answer then because as i mentioned democrats would control both houses of congress for the next two years and who knew what would happen um in in the off-year elections he did call for a conference of slave owning states he did that both um in a letter to the slave, all the governors of the slave states, and in made that um, recommendation to the General Assembly in his first address to it in late January of 1860. In his letter to the governors, he also included what he perceived would be a solution to the problem. It was presumed almost immediately after Lincoln's election that mere legislation would not solve the problem legislation comes, it goes, but what was required was an amendment to the Constitution guaranteeing the slave-owning states um, generally protections for slavery. McGoffin's amendment was uh, consisted of about four parts. Uh, it protected the rights of runaway slave, owners of runaway slaves. It divided the Western territories at the 37th parallel, the 37th parallel then was the dividing line between the New Mexico Territory and the Utah Territory. You'll recall that in 1850, when the United States received the Mexican cession following the war with Mexico, in 1850, it created the state of California as a non-slave state and divided the rest of the cession into two territories, New Mexico to the south and Utah to the north. At that point, New Mexico territory ranged from Texas to California. Arizona was re, would remain a part of the New Mexico territory until 1863. The one of the major issues was whether slavery would be able to go into the Western territories. The Republican Party was opposed to it. South was very concerned. New Mexico was the uh, most obvious territory where slave would expand into. So McGoffin divided the territory, protected slavery below the, the 37th parallel and prohibited it above the 37th parallel. His amendment would have guaranteed the free navigation of the Mississippi River, obviously important to Kentucky with its, uh, with its transport of goods on the, on the Ohio River. And it, in an oddly and vaguely written clause, he, he didn't specify, but he wanted to give power to the South, enhanced power to the South to protect um, the South, uh, protect the institution of slavery. And he wanted to do that somehow in the Senate. He didn't, wasn't specific about how that, how that would happen, but uh, that was his, his solution to the problem. They, when he proposed this to the General Assembly, they declined to call such a gathering, probably because Virginia beat them to the punch. The, uh, the governor of Virginia, John Letcher, had proposed to his General Assembly in early January a meeting, a national meeting of all the states to come up with a solution to the secession of the Lower South. This became known as the Washington 
Peace Conference. 21 states sent delegates. They met in Washington at the Willard Hotel. If you're familiar with Washington, the Willard Hotel still exists. Um, and, uh, and they came up with their own proposal. Kentucky sent six delegates, including James Clay, the son of Henry Clay, more about him shortly. The conference, as I mentioned, proposed a constitutional uh, a solution that was not too different from Senator John Crittenden's, Kentucky Senator John Crittenden's, which I will elaborate on shortly. Um, and at the end of February, at the end of the gathering, sent the solution, sent the constitutional amendment to Congress. It was largely ignored. Uh, this was the last week of February, Monday of March 4th, Lincoln was inaugurated and Congress went out of business. After, uh, after Lincoln's inauguration, everybody waited for about five months to see how this would play out. Seven states had already seceded, the Deep South. They had created the, a constitution. They had created the uh, Confederate States of America, elected um, Jefferson Davis as its president. And so the country played a waiting game for about five months months until, of course, Confederate guns fired on the federal fort of um, fort, fort, uh, the fort in, in Charleston Harbor. And Lincoln called for 75,000 troops to solve the insurrection, as he called it. Both McGoffin and the General Assembly quickly issued neutrality proclamations. They said, we cannot fight against our southern states, but nor can we take up arms against the United States. We're going to wait this one out. And of course, that neutrality lasted for about six months before Confederate states, Confederate forces invaded this, the, the state, followed by United States forces, and the war came to Kentucky. That's the general arc of, of Kentucky's history in this secession winter that um, I've been examining. The second arc concerns uh, attempts to find a constitutional solution to the secession issue, and Kentucky played a major role in that. I'm going to pause here and talk about the concerns that the South had uh, over secession winter after Lincoln's, Lincoln's election sort of made it real. They were concerned about Republicans since the Republican Party had been established in 1854 following the, the Kansas-Nebraska Act. It was a party that based its, 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 its unity on opposition to slavery in the territories, among other things. And so the primary, there are a number of, of grievances that the South had, and we can we can uh, codify these, these amendments. And there were a number of them. I'm going to talk about the top four, the four that the top four that became the most popular that we talked about the most in these various gatherings of elected officials throughout the country. As I said, the Republican platform of 1860 was opposed to the extension of slavery into, um, into the Western territories, the only territory that it could logically go into or that anybody presumed it could go into would be New Mexico, just west of Texas. The reality in 1860, and this is one of the odd facets of secession winter, is that in 1859, the New Mexico territorial legislature had developed a very detailed, stringent slave code that protected slavery in the territory. It protected all of the perhaps two dozen slaves um, in the New Mexico territory that had been brought in by military personnel. There's a history behind that. Uh, the, the New Mexico thought the winds were blowing one way when in fact they were blowing the other way. Nevertheless, in 1860, New Mexico was a slave territory. Slavery, of course, was also protected in slavery through the Dred Scott decision of 1857, when Roger B. Taney decided that Congress could not prohibit slavery in the territories. Territorial legislatures could not prohibit slavery in the territories. Only a territory, when it became a state, when it developed a state constitution, could then it decide whether it wanted to allow slavery or 
prohibit slavery. So in, in spite of the Republican position of opposing slavery in the territories, the logical place where it could go, New Mexico, was already a slave territory protected both by the territorial legislature and the Supreme Court decision. Interestingly enough, later in the, it would be the second session of the 36th Congress after Lincoln's election, when seven states seceded and Republicans took control of both houses, Congress organized the, the Utah Territory into three territories, Dakota, Colorado, and Nevada, and prohibited slavery in none of them. So in spite of its own platform, the Republican Congress declined to prohibit slavery from the three territories that it organized. So it's one of the odd things over secession winter that you think it's going one way and then Republicans do something else. Nevertheless, the South continued to be concerned and voice those concerns that the Republican Party was going to prohibit slave owners from taking their slaves into the Western territories. The return of fugitive slaves was the second most popular grievance that the South voiced. From, uh, from the beginning of the 19th century, Northern states began developing personal liberty laws to protect Northern blacks, largely from kidnapping, uh, which was very common in those days. We've all seen 12 years a slave, which happened a lot. Uh, some of these personal liberty laws, and they were, they were reissued and elaborated upon over the six decades, five decades leading up to, to secession winter, some of them interfered, uh, interfered with the fugitive slave law of 1850. If you were a slave owner, of course, it only took one instance when, when your slave could not be returned to you from making that a personal issue. And so the return of fugitive slaves was the second most popular grievance and the failure to return those slaves on the part of, of the North uh, became a second issue. The, the third one is uh, maybe a very logical one. That was slavery in the District of Columbia. Obviously, Southern senators and, re and representatives, when they went to the District of Columbia, would take slaves uh, with them to, to provide for their needs while Congress was in session. The slave trade in Washington, D.C. had been abolished in 1850, but slavery continued there, and the Southern delegates to Congress were very concerned that Republicans were going to prevent them from continuing that practice. The fourth issue was the transit of slaves with their owners, uh, which came out of a basically a, a, a law case, a slave, uh, the, what is called the Lemon Slave Case between Virginia and New York. It ran from 1852 to 1860. Jonathan and Juliet Lemon were living in the Shenandoah Valley, wanted to go to Texas for reasons we don't understand, um, and uh, didn't want to go overland. So they decided the fastest way would be to go from Virginia to New York City on a, on a boat and then take a packet around to New Orleans and then across New Orleans into Texas. They, Jonathan and Juliet Lemon were aware that New York a decade earlier in 1842 had passed a law that said essentially, if New York is a free state, it's a free state. Any slave coming into the state with its owner his or her owner would be free the minute they crossed the state line. The Lemons had eight slaves with them. They arrived in New York Harbor. The slaves were immediately removed from them. Uh, the, they were hauled into court. The judge deliberated for a week and then determined that uh, the law was very clear. His hands were tied. He had no, no option but in freeing the slaves, which were quickly taken to Canada. Virginia was very upset and appealed the case to the New York Supreme Court and the New York Court of Appeals, losing both times, which was just fine with the then governor of Virginia, Henry Alexander Wise, who was ready to take it to the Supreme Court, where he presumed, and historians today presume, that if it had gone to the Supreme Court, Roger B. Taney would have decided in the favor of Virginia and not New York. For reasons we don't understand, and a colleague of, and I wrote an article about this, we dug deeply into the, 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 the records of Virginia. Uh, the, the next governor, uh, John Letcher, did not send the case to the Supreme Court. 
um, um, it, it's, it would have been an, a slam dunk, as they say, but he didn't. Uh, nevertheless, the transit of slaves with their owners through free states and territories was a major issue to the South. The general concerns um, that, were, that, that the South developed was that Republicans, they believed, were abolitionists. Lincoln was an abolitionist. The North was filled with abolitionists uh, of the John Brown stripe that were ready to attack the South at any time. None of that was true. The Republican Party was not an abolitionist party in 1860. Lincoln was certainly not. And the reality in the North was only about 2% of the voting population in the South self-identified as abolitionists. Abolitionists were loud, they were vocal, they were obnoxious if you were a Southerner. Uh, but the reality was they had no political throw weight. So to address these, these issues, elected officials over the course of secession winter proposed 68 different constitutional amendments to solve the problem. 68 amendments. A study of these amendments in 1898 described this as a virtual flood of proposals to amend the Constitution. Of those 68, the most popular uh, and the most talked about and, and discussed was that by Kentucky Senator John Crittenden. In preparing for this, this presentation, I pulled out my college history textbook, my 50-year-old college history textbook, The American Pageant, published in 1971, uh, to see what it said. And not to my surprise, the only compromise proposal it mentioned was that of John Crittenden and his six-part constitutional amendment that he proposed on December 18th of 1860. It, uh, it would have been, of course, the next, it would have been the next amendment, which would have made it the 13th amendment. It was not approved by Congress, was not ratified, but nevertheless, it became very popular. It had six parts, and, and the parts will, uh, six articles, and they'll become very uh, familiar to you. He divided the Western territories at 3630, the old Missouri Compromise line, uh, and allowed slavery to the South, prohibited slavery to the North. He thought this was a great concession, since the Supreme Court had already decided that slave owners could take their slaves anywhere in the territories. Crittenden thought this was a concession that Republicans would appreciate. He uh, changed, the, improved the Fugitive Slave Clause of the Constitution, trying to make the return of fugitive slaves a bit more equitable. His constitutional amendment would have protected slavery in the District of Columbia. It would have protected the transit of slaves throughout the country. It would have protected slavery in federal installations in slave holding states, forts, arsenals, shipyards, the United States Mint in New Orleans. And it prevented Congress, would have prevented Congress from abolishing slavery in the states. His sixth article also would have prevented Congress from revisiting and revising any of the first five articles of his amendment. Essentially, Crittenden made his amendment unamendable by future Congresses. About two weeks later, he added a seventh article that read, it's very short, um, it read, the elective franchise, I'm quoting, the elective franchise and the right to hold office, whether federal, state, territorial, or municipal, shall not be exercised by persons who are in whole or in part of the African race. Of course, Black people couldn't vote in the South. Crittenden wanted to make sure they couldn't vote or hold office in the North as well. It's important to note that Crittenden borrowed this article from an amendment that had been earlier proposed by Illinois Senator Stephen Douglas. 13 other amendments proposed or proposed over secession winter contained this similar language, two by Northern Democrats, senators from Ohio and Illinois. Belief in white supremacy was not limited to the South then or now. Of the 68 amendments proposed, it's important to note that 90% were designed to protect slavery at the federal level. I'll, I'll say that again. Of the 68 amendments proposed, 90% were designed to protect slavery at the federal level. Each of the authors of these 
constitutional amendments were very, very willing to transfer protections for slavery from the state level to the federal level. So much for protecting states' rights and secession. Um, five other Kentuckians proposed amendments. I talked about Beriah McGoffins. Senator Lazarus Powell was a senator from Kentucky. And at the early, early days of the second session of the 36th Congress, he said the Senate ought to develop, ought to establish a committee to discuss secession and see what they could come up with. Uh, you, you should be careful what you wish for. Lazarus Powell was made the chair of that committee. Uh, they discussed this issue most of December, but by the end of the month, Powell reported to the Senate that they couldn't agree on anything and abandoned the committee. Uh, Rep Kentucky Representative Robert Mallory proposed a constitutional amendment. State Senator Benjamin Sissel in the State Senate proposed an amendment. Delegate uh, uh, James Clay reintroduced Crittenden's amendment in the Washington Peace Convention. The Virginia General Assembly, when it called the Washington Peace Conference, said that if uh, if the conference would agree to John Crittenden's amendment with several slight modifications, that would be acceptable to the people of Virginia. James Clay, during the discussion, thought it was going a little off track, and to bring them back to Crittenden's amendment, reintroduced it as, as his proposal, including the seventh article dealing with elective franchise and office holding for Blacks. Kentucky's Amendments touched on the same uh, issues that were popular throughout the South, dividing the territories, fugitive slaves, protecting slavery in the District of Columbia, and protecting slavery in federal installations in the South. The concerns of Kentucky were identical to the other slave states protecting the institution of slavery. Crittenden's amendment was popular and, and uh, uh, recognized throughout the country. In, in the Kentucky book, I have a chapter on resolutions that were submitted to Congress by Northerners as well as Southerners, most of them favoring the Crittenden Compromise. Let's not go to war. Let's solve this problem. Let's agree to John Crittenden's amendment because it uh, was the most comprehensive. It touched on almost all the grievances of the South and many Southerners, including uh, some Northerners, also believed that it was the path to calm the waters in the country. Crittenden's amendment did not nationalize slavery, as 11 of the 68 amendments did. He protected it in many ways throughout the country, but he did not officially nationalize it. The poster child for this idea was Senator Jefferson Davis from Mississippi, who on December 22nd of 1860 proposed one constitutional amendment with one article which read, quote, that property and slaves recognized as such by the local law of any of the states of the union shall stand on the same footing in all constitutional and federal relations as any other species so recognized. Senator Jefferson Davis, soon to become President Jefferson Davis of the Confederacy, was very willing in December to trade state authority for federal authority if it would result in greater protections for slavery. This is sort of at the other end of the spectrum from secession uh, happening to protect states' rights. Davis and others were very willing to trade state authority for federal authority to that to protect the uh, protect the institution of slavery. When I started bumping into these amendments, and they they come up fairly quickly when you read in the this primary this primary material, I didn't know what to do with them. I didn't understand them. No one had written about them before as a group. Crittenden was very popular. Um, the, uh, there was another amendment that was passed that I will talk about in a minute. Sometimes made it into the the history books, but nobody had looked at these as a group. So I. I didn't understand what they were. I didn't know if they were red herrings, uh, that everyone knew they wouldn't get passed, but it would bide time for either the South or the North. Um, and as I pondered them, I thought, well, maybe there's a test I can, I can put them to. Uh, 
Um, and I started looking at the Confederate Constitution. And I decided or thought um, that if these, amend these 68, 68 amendments and the ideas in these amendments were reflected in the Confederate Constitution, that I would understand what was going on. If the Confederate Constitution didn't reflect these ideas, then I'd be lost again, and I'd have to go to Plan B, whatever that was. As it turns out, the Constitution makers in Montgomery had been paying attention to what was going on nationally and in these other venues and incorporated some of them, the most important ones, I think we could say, into the Confederate Constitution. The Confederate Constitution did what Jefferson Davis wanted to happen in his amendment. It nationalized slavery, not exactly in the way he proposed it, but nevertheless, uh, slavery was nationalized throughout the country. In the Confederate Constitution, protections for slavery moved from the state level to the federal level. And they did it in a very sophisticated, I, I think, manner. They um, included in the Constitution several phrases such as slaves and other property, uh, property and slaves, property and African slaves, making the point that slaves were identified as property in the Constitution and thus would be protected under the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment, which they had incorporated into the body of the Confederate Constitution. The Confederate Constitution has no amendments. Um, it, it, they took the first 12 amendments and, and built them into the body of it. So uh, slaves were protected as property. To make sure it was understood that they were protected, slaves were protected, they added two other clauses in the Constitution that said, if the, if the Confederacy acquires a territory at some point, slavery will be protected there and owners can take their slaves freely into those new territories. It also made a point of saying that owners can take their slaves wherever they want to throughout the Confederacy. It's the transit of slaves issue again, and the Confederate Constitution protected, um, protected that. The pro-slavery arguments uh, that occurred throughout the country are, are pretty obvious because it reflected the major concerns of, of the South. The anti-slavery arguments are a little more interesting because, in fact, Crittenden's resolution was not approved by Congress. And the basic argument against it was, by the Republicans, we won the White House, and we won the White House fair and square. We won it with a platform that said we're opposed to slavery in the Western territories. And we won, not the majority, but won uh, a 39% of the vote, which is enough to, to put Lincoln in the White House. Why should we compromise on the very issue upon which we had won the election? The second argument was that the Southern grievances were not against the federal government, but against Northern states, Northern states not returning fugitive slaves. The arguments were against the Republicans and what they were saying, not doing, but, but saying, but the, to, the, to the point, the arguments, the grievances were not against the federal government. The, the place to take up these grievances were in the courts, in the court system, not in amending the United States Constitution. In fact, the federal government had not restricted slavery in any way over the past decade. In, in 1850, it created, as I said earlier, the Utah and New Mexico territories and allowed those territories to decide for themselves and did not prescribe slavery in those two territories. In 1854, it legislatively repudiated the Missouri Compromise, which prohibited slavery in Louisiana above the 3630 line and allowed for the possibility of slavery in Kansas, Nebraska. It didn't work out very well, but nevertheless, the federal government had allowed the possibility of slavery. And in 1857, the Dred Scott decision had constitutionally annulled the Missouri Compromise, stating very clearly that slave owners could take their slaves wherever they wanted to throughout the territories. Another reason why Republicans rejected amend amendments of any kind is that some of Crittenden's suggested proposals impinged on Northern states' rights. 
the transit of slaves, for example. Did not New York have the right to say, we're a free state and we don't allow slaves even with their owners into the states? States had the right to decide who was a citizen and who could vote and hold office. And Crittenden's seventh article impinged on, on that right. Over those three months that the that, that Congress debated that, it did approve one amendment, the Thomas Corwin Amendment. Corwin was a Republican from Ohio, and late in the session, he proposed an amendment that would have prohibited Congress from interfering with or abolishing slavery in the states. He borrowed this amendment from, actually he borrowed the exact language of the amendment from Republican Senator William Henry Seward from New York. And a different version from Republican Representative Charles Francis Adams of Massachusetts. He, uh, the, the grandson of John and son of John Quincy. Six other Republicans proposed the same sort of amendment. Again, it prohibited Congress from interfering or with or abolishing slavery in the states. It passed both houses of Congress. It passed the Senate, secondly, uh, in the early morning hours of March 4th, Inauguration Day of 1861. Lincoln alludes to it in his first inaugural. He says, I understand an amendment uh, such as this has been approved by the Senate. I haven't seen it, but I know of it, and I approve of it, and wouldn't mind if it were being made, if it were made perpetual. It was then ratified by six states, five states, I'm sorry, including Kentucky, uh, the Kentucky legislature debated it for a bit, not lengthy, but a bit, and said nobody presumed that Congress had the authority to interfere with slavery in the states. But if this will give us increased protections from Republican incursions, then let's vote for it. Ohio, Rhode Island, Maryland, and Illinois also voted for it before the war rolled over it. And the 13th Amendment then became one of uh, prohibiting slavery instead of protecting it. Crittenden's Amendment, let me conclude on this note, how we do on time. Um, uh, it, um, amendment was not approved by Congress, but Crittenden created a second bookend to the war. Of course, the first bookend was Fort Sumter and Appomattox. His amendment created a bookend because on December 18th, 1860, he proposed his version of a 13th amendment to protect slavery. Exactly five years to the day, December 18th, 1865, the 13th amendment prohibiting slavery was added to the United States Constitution by Secretary of State, Republican um, uh, Seward, William Seward. Uh, who had originally proposed an amendment that said Congress has no authority over slavery in the states. Five years later, he actively put added the 13th Amendment into the Constitution um, prohibiting slavery. So let, let me stop there. I hope this has prompted some, uh, some, some questions. And I think, uh, James, I hope we have time to talk about those. We do have a little bit of time here. Uh, so if anybody does have any questions uh, for our presenter, just I said, go ahead and type them into the Q&A box there. Uh, in the meantime, I do have some questions of my own. Maybe you'll be able to answer or address. Um, looking at what's going on in 1860, 1861, and Kentucky really seems to be at the center of all of this. I mean, clearly there, there are people coming from other states, other border states, even Virginia, who are proposing uh, uh, different ways that uh, uh, peace might be achieved, different compromises. But really, when you think about this, you know, you, you have the vaguest idea of what was going on at the time. You know, Kentucky really seems to be at the center of this idea of compromise. Um, why do you think that is? What was it like socially or politically or demographically that that kind of set Kentucky apart? That they were really kind of in the forefront of this of trying to find this middle ground and, and, and establish. Uh, you know, some kind of compromise and peace to, to, to prevent a, a civil war in 1861? Well, uh, one answer might be as realtors say, location, location, location. Uh, it was a border state on the Ohio River, uh, bordered on the north by three non-slave states, uh, doing commerce with those states regularly, 
it didn't have the fire eaters that say Georgia or Mississippi or certainly South Carolina had. It it was in a in a geographical position where it said let's let's think about this a a little more. Um, you, you know, when when after Fort Sumter and Lincoln's call for troops, four more states seceded, the upper South, North Carolina, um, Virginia, Tennessee, and Arkansas. But those four border states of Rhode Island, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri stayed in the Union. So I think the, the location is one. The other is Crittenden was the grand old man of the of that Congress. He was 74, 75 years old, respected by anyone, everyone. Um, even those who opposed his amendment paid due homage to him as an honorable, respected senator. He was the successor of, of Henry Clay. He he actually took Henry Clay's seat at one point when, when Henry Clay resigned from the Senate. Um and and I think it is it's as I write in the book, it's the comprehensive nature of his amendment that was backed up by by these other men. So the, the history of amendments I I dealt with in the in the Kansas book, all sixty eight. Um, I, th I I might have said, or maybe I didn't in my talk, that Virginia came up with the most solutions, sixteen. Tennessee was next with nine. Kentucky was next with its six. Um, but I think it's it's the location of it, and I think it was just that the Kentuckians, including Crittenden, realized that a war was going to disrupt its way of life and this commerce that it had um, with the North on friendly terms across on the other side of the Ohio River. Okay, yeah. Um, oh, we got some questions coming in here now. Okay, so I'll, I'll pose one from the audience, one of the audience members here. Um, so why did Lincoln say that, quote, to lose Kentucky is nearly the same as to lose the whole game when talking about the secession crisis? Was he right? Um, I, I don't know if he was right. Uh, it's hard to say, but of course it was his birthplace. He had, he had attachments here, didn't, when he lived here in Kentucky 10 years or so before he moved to, to, um, Illinois. Um, I think he, it, that, Again, it's the location thing on the Ohio River. Um, if the Confederacy reached to the Ohio River, then that might change the game plan of how you might have seen more incursions into the North. Um, as it were, it was the Potomac River that was largely the dividing line between North and South. Um, and I think I think he he thought that if we lost it, uh, if the, if the, if he lost it, if the North lost it, then Confederate troops would quickly move into Kentucky and then be uh, be ready to move into other parts of the North from there. I think it might have been a bit of rhetoric as well, uh, which Lincoln was, of course, very good at. Uh, it's a nice turn of phrase that's oft repeated. Right. And we, uh, there's another similar question here. And there's more or less speculation, your personal opinion on this. Uh, do you feel that Kentucky's delay to pick sides on the topic of secession caused the war to shift to other fronts in the country and ease the impact of fighting in the state as a border state? Um, I, uh, it's speculation, isn't it? Uh, Kentucky was uh, clearly a union state. Um, I, I think a couple of figures uh, prove that most of the men who volunteered for the United States or the Confederacy, I think it's two thirds or more, uh, went for the United States, and uh, a third went to uh, went to the Confederacy. Also, in the in the summer of 1861, the voters of the state returned Unionist majorities strong unionist majorities, both to the state house, to the general assembly and to, uh, to Congress. So the, the mood of the state, in spite of having this sort of undercurrent of secessionists um, was very much in favor of, of union. And uh, it seems to me that it, 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 it would remain a unionist state as it, as it did. I, it's a, I, I'm uncomfortable with that answer, but I think it's the best I can do. Right. Speculation, but yeah, 
uh, nobody else yet. So I, I, I have another question of my own then. Um, when we started out this talk, you mentioned this idea of uncomfortable history uh, and how it was presented uh, and how the park handled it uh, uh, many years ago. Um, and I think that's really relevant to today. Um, you know, as a former educator myself, and as a sometimes uh, adjunct, and you're working in a museum environment, I mean, these, these questions come up, you know, the idea of causality uh, and those sort of things, especially in the political environment today, this idea of uncomfortable history and uh, what can you say, what can you not say, and history being under attack and that sort of thing. I'm wondering if you could speak to how this book might be used by educators um and, and how it might help them navigate that idea of tough history or uncomfortable history sure uh it, it is uncomfortable and it continues to be and and when i wrote uh when i write these and what i'm in now in my fifth book i think dealing with these issues certainly when i was writing writing the first one the kansas book i had in mind my students that i taught at new mexico state for 15 years and uh museum and and, and historic site uh, interpreters who are on the front lines of dealing with this issue um, to the public. And one of the pleasures, I think, of writing the kinds of books I write, which are documentary histories, they're, uh, they, they have, uh, they're, they're filled with the, the official records of, of secession with a, a, a turns out in almost all cases, a, a long introduction by me trying to create a context for it, um, the, 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 the elected officials of the country over secession winter were by and large very well educated men. They were very articulate. Um, if, you, if you look at any of them, I'm often having to put in explanatory footnotes about allusions to a Shakespeare quote or a classic literature quote of another kind or a Latin phrase. Um, and these men, uh, weren't at all shy about saying what they meant and meaning what they say. Uh, they were very clear and they talked about slavery and they talked about fear of losing white supremacy on a regular basis. And so I think it's, um, as I've said before, I've maybe written before, if you don't like what's in these books, don't argue with me, argue with Jefferson Davis, argue with Mariah McGoffin, argue with John, John Crittenden. Um, because the and and of course, because it is this kind of book, I very carefully cite the original source for the document, whatever it happens to be. And it's um it's it's a fascinating, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that I ended up doing this uh, because every every state is a little different, but it's variations on a theme. They're all concerned about slavery and losing it. They're all concerned about white supremacy and losing it. And it provides, I think, the, the, the logical and reasonable intellectual antidote to the, the arguments that we continue to hear that, that the Civil War wasn't about slavery, that all slaves were happy and, and so on and so forth, and that um, um, racist issues started after the Civil War, not before. But in fact, the South, very clear, from all these documents, the South seceded to protect slavery and to protect white supremacy. And the, the men who, they were all men, of course, uh, in these various venues arguing this made that very clear. It takes no interpretation on my part to come to that conclusion. Thank you for that, because I, I know there were some uh, educators that were in the in the audience tonight. Um, so let me, uh, let me conclude here. So I, we are gonna run short on time. I don't wanna run over. Uh, with one final question, and this is actually from your questions from discussion in the back part of your book, because you you did conveniently add those for 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 teachers. So let I me do. ask you. Let me ask you one of your your own your own questions. Uh, is this a test to see if I can answer my own question? <laughs> Speculation, uh, of course. The pressure is on. Okay, so imagine the Crittenden Amendment had passed both houses of Congress. War had been averted. The institution of slavery strengthened through federal protection. Would it have eventually died out as Republicans had hoped? Or would it have continued into the 20th century in some modified form? I guess the essence of this really is, could the end of slavery have been brought about by any means short of war? And that's, that's I think that's really the main question. What a great question that is. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's something that I, I ponder as, as I go through um, all of these 
all of these uh, these documents, uh, what if uh, compromise had been reached? What if the South hadn't seceded? Of course, I think the, the first step in this, the South didn't have to secede, as I hope I made the point. Republicans weren't abolitionists in 1860. They became abolitionists because of the war and ended up with the 13th Amendment. But going into the war, as, as Lincoln said repeatedly, he has no way, no constitutional way and no interest in affecting slavery in the states. So I, 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 I'm not sure there's an answer to this, but it's fairly easy for me to think of um, a country without a civil war that the Crittenden Amendment or some other amendment protected slavery. The South was content. It didn't feel threatened. Would slavery have died out? Slavery as an economic um, engine would have been affected, of course, by mass agriculture, industrialized agriculture, cotton pickers, and that sort of thing. But it's it it was it's become and it has been very clear to me that underlying the economic advantages of slavery was this idea of white supremacy, this notion of white supremacy. And it, it, you can look at news every night now and see that it didn't go away, that a large portion of this country still uh, adheres to a white su supremacist ideology. And it, I think it's entirely plausible that had there been no war, slavery would have continued well into the 21st century, 20th century, maybe into the 21st century, obviously in, in different ways, it would have been um, uh, changed in some ways, but this, but the notion of white supremacy would have continued to fight against any kind of broad scale equity brought for America, African Americans, African Americans in this country. Keep in mind that the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s was based on the two constitutional amendments that came out of the war and were created because of the war, the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment. Had there been no war, those amendments would there would have been no impetus to create those amendments. So I think it's it's fairly it's fairly easy for me anyway to think that slavery would not have died out um, of its own accord. It was certainly not in any form dying out in 1860 and 1861, it was expanding. The, and interestingly enough, the Census Bureau of 1860, the Census Bureau when it developed the 1860 census actually projected slave populations out until 1890. So the, the, you know, it, it assumed that slavery would continue um, in at least that long. So it's an interesting question. Uh, there's no good answer to it, but it's an interesting to, a question to play around with. Yeah, and, and thank you for that. I know uh, counterfactuals. Not counterfactual really our, history. Not really our business, but they are, you know, it, yeah, they can be interesting. Okay. Okay, well, it is now about 7.30, so we're going to go ahead and, uh, and wrap this up. Um, uh, this concludes the first presentation in our Kentucky Military History Museum speaker series. And again, I'd like to thank our presenter, uh, Dr. Pitt Caithley, uh, for his time and for illuminating this complicated period in Kentucky history um, and for our, and to our audience as well for their interest in this topic. Thank you for everybody who, uh, who attended. I, this was very uh, enjoyable for me. I hope it was for everybody else. And again, just another reminder, our next pre presentation will be next month on April 25th. Uh, it's Jonathan Jones. who will be talking about Civil War soldiers and opioid, opioid addiction. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll, we will go ahead and conclude uh, this session. And again, thank you, everybody. And I hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Dwight.